Suddenly, I'm a street portrait photographer. I may be driving home, and suddenly I'm a landscape photographer. I don't have a studio. I don't have any lights. I don't know how to tell um, people how to pose. I, I find all of that really awkward. I, I am one of those people who always has the camera with me. It, it's in my shoulder bag. Every, you know, if I walk out of my office, I have the camera with me. Whatever works for you, let the, re let the rest of the noise from the photographic how-to community be just that. Dear photography friends, Tomasz here. I am the editor of Frames magazine, quarterly printed uh, photography publication. And you know, uh, I decided to do something a bit different with this channel uh, from now on. Uh, there is so much very valuable um, photographic content on the on YouTube. Um, people are working in different formats, you know, uh, running different kinds of um, uh, videos. Uh, I mean, up, off the top of my head, you know, uh, the channels I regularly watch, you know, and, and enjoy. Sean Tucker's channel, Ted Forbes, Alex Kilby, you know, uh, that will be the three of my most favorite photography channels, you know, here on YouTube. Uh, but I noticed that with some, you know, small exceptions, there is not much content where the owners of the channels, you know, um, talk to other photographers, talk to photographers about their work, about their um, inspirations and thoughts behind their work, behind their uh, ideas. Uh, of course, the channels, you know, the owners of the channels I just mentioned do truly amazing job when it comes to, to sharing their thoughts and their, you know, uh, choices and uh, photographic inspirations and, you know, um, it's, it's extremely valuable, but I, I, I thought there is a gap, there is a certain uh, area which is not really, you know, explored and covered very, very, um, you know, successfully. Uh, and, and I want to try, I want to try to make this channel a place where we talk to other photographers, you know, where we have different guests on the channel where you can really connect, you know, face to face with other photographers, because I think uh, we tend to, you know, analyze, interpret uh, other people's work, right? We find photography that speaks to us, that we resonate with. And we kind of try to attach our own uh, interpretations, you know, uh, we are trying to find words, you know, to, to explain what we are feeling when looking at any particular piece of photographic work. And, and you know, very often we are, we, are, we are right there with what the photographer's intentions were, but, but not always. And I find it extremely fascinating, you know, to talk to those, to the, to, to the artists themselves, you know, to find out if, if our interpretation, if our reading of their photographs um, corresponds and to what extent corresponds with, with their own thoughts. So, uh, yeah, let's make this Frames channel, you know, uh, a very lively kind of photography corner where we all meet, where I invite, you know, uh, more or less famous photographers to be here with us and sometimes live. I'm also uh, actually thinking about some live streams, you know, let's see how it works. I'm trying to figure out the technology to do it all properly, but Let's make this place a bit more lively, you know, it's not only me talking to the camera. Well, now I am, but it's just an introduction, you know, to, to this idea. Uh, let's have different artists, photographers of different genres, sharing their thoughts, talking to us about their work. Uh, we are starting today, uh, and you know, my very first guest is W. Scott Olsen, good friend, uh, member of the Frames editorial team, so many of you will be familiar with Scott uh, in, you know, in many different forms with his content, which he is preparing for frames, with the podcast, with the interviews, you know, and book reviews. But Scott is a, a very avid and enthusiastic, you know, photographer uh, himself. So I decided to, to start this, this, uh, this video series with him 
to dig deeper, to talk about his photography and, and, and about his uh, motivations and inspirations. Without uh, further ado, here is the very first, you know, uh, conversation of this kind on this channel. I hope you will enjoy it. Scott, welcome to Frames YouTube channel. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Let's start with this very first conversation of this of this kind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me about your photography. Uh, well, that, that's sort of an open question. I'm not entirely sure where to begin. The wherever, wherever you want, you know. That's the idea. I, I came very late into an awareness of my photography, and as I as I sort of realized that photography was becoming more and more important in my life. I did start looking back, trying to think, where were the seeds planted? Where were uh, the first um, bits of evidence that I should pay more attention here? And there's a lot of memories of having a camera, you know, a little Instamatic with a flash cube on top, you know, that kind of stuff. And not one of those memories, I think, are important. Um, you know, the, the camera is ubiquitous. It, it, everybody has some version of it. And now, of course, today everyone's got one on their cell phone. But even back in the you know 1960s and 70s and then before, um, I had a camera. I, I was not a photographer. I was just somebody taking pictures. But fast forward, then I was working on um, what was going to be my second book uh, of, of writing, and I took a picture of an old abandoned railway station near here um, in, in a town called Prosper. The railway station was completely falling apart and dilapidated, you know, rotten boards, paint chipping, but it had the sign on it. It said Prosper on it. And I took a picture of it. It became the cover of the book. Um, but that little bit of irony, that little bit of disconnect um, is, I think, the first time that, that I looked at my own work and said, this image has some artistic value. Um, I can't yeah, say you know, that that afternoon I didn't go home and, you know, declare myself a photographer. Yeah, yeah. But that's the moment I started paying attention. Yeah, okay, but this was the moment where you started kind of, um, you know, creating your own images. But so how about looking at photographs? All, you know, all those years before, did, do you remember any kind of um, moments where you were, you know, in awe with an image? Or like, you know, you oh, it's a, it's a cool photograph. Do you remember anything like that? Absolutely. There was an old ad for um, an audio cassette in, in which the, the, there's a guy sitting in a chair. He's sitting in front of a speaker. Um, and his, he, the hair's blowing back. His scarf's blowing back. He's got a little, uh, I think it's a martini glass on his, on his you know, side table. It, it's about uh -huh. to fall off. And it was a brilliant, brilliant ad, actually, for, for this uh, audio cassette. And what really, really appealed to me was that what this picture was about was not in the picture. Um, you know, the sound, the force, the, the, the acoustic wind coming out of the speaker. You could not see anything in this image that was really what the image was about. And yet you knew it was there. It was absolutely obvious. Um, that one really struck me. I'm also old enough to have been um, aware during the Vietnam War. So a lot of those pictures that came back were just gut punches. They, they, they were uh, absolutely, you know, heart wrenching. And I, I remember thinking back then, um, not only about the politics of the time, but about the power of the image to affect an emotion in the viewer. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I was visiting a, a, an, an exhibition. Of, I'm based in Switzerland, right? You know, and so I, I was visiting a small exhibition. Not, not so small. It was qu quite an exhibition of a Swiss, one of the, you know, renowned uh, Swiss photographers, Guido okay. Baselgia, yesterday. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting. There was like a introductory kind of talk at the very beginning. You know, there was him, there was the curator of the gallery, and there was a guy from a, from a photography foundation, you know, one of the... Mm -hmm. Yep. foundations and they were you know having this open open talk open discussions in front discussion in front of the audience in front of us and uh, yeah you just mentioned that, uh, that the photograph you you saw those years ago you know one of those photos uh, you realized that the photo was not 
about what you actually can see in the photo. Right. I mean, all, and they were discussing it a lot yesterday. And this photographer, he is maybe 75 years old today, uh, said, yeah, he went through different, you know, all possible phases in his career. And today he, you know, or a couple of years ago, he arrived at this point where he doesn't care much about what the viewer sees or doesn't see, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the photo. He yeah. is expressing himself. He's experimenting. He, he thinks, you know, he, photographs, you know, points his camera at something which he thinks or he feels connects with his internal feelings, ideas, emotions, whatever. So it's a very free process, you know, he was mm -hmm. completely, it's just all free. It's all about freedom. It's all about, you know, uh, expressing yourself. So where, where are you today? Like, I mean, we will be looking at your photos in a, in a minute. You, put, you, you, you photograph a lot of, you know, scenes from the streets, you know, but also you go into some still life, you go into some kind of, you know, different genres in your portfolio, right. I would say. Where are you when it comes to this, um, <laughs> yeah, what do you photograph? What it's, I see on the photo, do you care? What about you, you, you care when it comes to all this, you know, art of right. I, 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 I really resist a lot of restricting definitions. Um, my artistic career before photography was all writing. Uh, my first book was, was a collection of short stories. And, and then I've got about 11 books after that, that are all narrative nonfiction. Um, some of it travel, some of it adventure, some of it not. But the, the glory of being a nonfiction writer is that you can be interested in anything. I could be writing about paper clips tomorrow or today and nuclear war tomorrow. The same thing I think applies to my life as a photographer. I am still a nonfiction storyteller and I might go out with the intent to be a photojournalist. You know, something is happening. I, I'm going to, you know, I'm thinking about the newspaper here in town. Um, but while I'm taking pictures of that, something else may happen just to the side. And now suddenly I'm a street portrait photographer. Um, I may be driving home and suddenly I'm a landscape photographer. Um, I, I am not someone who wants to say my work is all only about self-expression. Uh, sometimes it, it's reporting, but I believe in, in, in my understanding of myself as a photographer, I am telling stories and I don't really care what genre or, or what, um, definition people want to put around that. I, I'm in the, the job of telling a story that is either of importance to the community or me or figure it out. Yeah, let, let me, you know, so, okay, but let me share your, your, the, the screen. We will be looking at your, at your website. Uh, okay. So, yeah, well, as you say, many, many different genres. I see street, I see, um, I see some kind of abstract Still, I see the still light. I see landscapes. Yeah. Uh, well, now, but is there any of those, uh, you know, genres which you kind of, you, you kind of prefer or like gravitate towards mainly, like what excites you the most? Um, serendipity excites me the most. Um, the, the planned shot, I am, first of all, really bad at. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a studio. I don't have any lights. I don't know how to tell um, people how to pose. Um, I, I find all of that really awkward uh, in my... Yeah, okay, well, let's stop, let's stop just here. Let's look at this picture then. <laughs> well, I, I would argue that, you know, that it's not the worst portrait in the world at all. Well, uh, thank you. Okay, let me try and understand what I see about this picture, then you okay. can chime in. So, I think you talked before taking it. I think you talked... My, I, my feeling is you, you talked to, to her... Before taking this picture, you had the idea. She's maybe, it's a beautiful light, but I think window light maybe, but uh, it's not through the glass, I think, and so on and so forth. So I, so obviously you, you know, posed her, I think. That's my, that's my suspicion here, right? Mm -hmm. And lighting is, the light is beautiful. Um, you know, the uh, dark background, she's, perfectly exposed you know the, the idea with the cap also being the same tones and uh, 
I mean, I, I love this shot. This shot. So, okay. What about you not being a, a <laughs> very good photographer? You have to defend about this. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'm tickled that you picked this picture because this picture has about a thousand stories behind it. Um, one of the things that I do here in town for the local newspaper uh, is that when all the high schools have their graduation, it's pretty much on the same day. And there's a bunch of high schools. And one of my jobs on that day is to drive madly between graduation ceremonies and take really generic but newspaper necessary pictures of high school kids graduating. Well, I was at this young woman's high school graduation and I saw her um, and her eyes are, struck me as being very much like uh, the actress from Queen's Gambit. I think her Anna Diarmas or, or whatever. And, and I was just really struck by her eyes. Um, the next Monday, um, I called up, and I had a picture of her from the, the graduation, but it, that was just, it was a nothing picture. Uh, I called up the high school and I said, this is going to sound really creepy. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I see where you're going with it. <laughs> you know, but, but I saw this young woman. Um, I know you can't tell me who it is, but you can give her my information uh, and if she's interested in a portrait, have her get in touch with me. Well, her mother called me a couple of days later uh, and said, yeah, but, you know, let, let's go do it. And we met at a coffee shop downtown, which is where that picture is. Um, what you can't see is that her mother is just outside the frame uh, sitting right next to her. Okay. And just by the grace of God, not through any planning, the barista handed us that cup. Uh, which matches all the tones and everything. Yep, I, I'm sitting, you know, right in front of her. Obviously, there's a window behind me, so yeah, and a big window. Um, the you know, I, I shot wide open. You can tell by the blur back there. And and this was even a. This is another funny thing. This is a camera that I'm not very comfortable with. Uh, for about a week and a half, I had a Fujifilm X100V at this point. Uh, and so that's the, the, so it's an unfamiliar camera, an unfamiliar model, a, a, an accident for the cup. Um, but I, I had her pose with her arms like that because I saw the cup and I said, okay, this is great. Um, yeah. and that, that, that's how that one came to be. Yeah. Okay. So you see, so, okay. Uh, I see some inconsistency here in your, in your, um, I know, so it's because I see it, at least a couple of very interesting portraits in here. Yep. Uh, let's take one more. Let's look at this one. Yeah, that, that's this a, one. That, that is a colleague of mine, Olin Storvik. He passed it a couple of years ago. Uh, he was an archaeologist here at the college where I teach. Um, and I was looking at him one day. There, there's a series that, that you don't see on the website. Where looking at him, and I was just thinking, well, okay, th this is what Zeus would look like if, if he was still around. And I decided to do a whole series of what the Greek and Roman gods would look like if they were still hanging around, if they, if they were masquerading oh. just, just as normal people. Um, and so, crops that one really tight around his face. And I mean, he, you know, and, and you know, the, the picture of the old person with a you know, wise face is not a new idea. Um, but he, I mean, he has a very interesting face. I love the different textures in his eyes. Um, and that was a gateway to what then became a fun series, you know, where I would look at someone and say, ah, you look like Mercury. Come here. <laughs> yeah. Great. I, I love this one. I mean, I love this, I love this, you know, tight crop and, uh, just the focus on his eyes. So how, do you feel comfortable, um, uh, you know, Talking to people, approaching people, and asking about, you know, I mean, he was your colleague, okay, but like right. the, the girl before, maybe you didn't know her. How, how about on this? You, you photograph also a lot on the streets, right? Yeah. Uh, and you also have some street portraits occasionally. Yep. Do you feel comfortable about approaching people? I feel comfortable approaching people, and I feel comfortable not approaching people. The, you know, people will say, oh, I never talk to someone, you know, because it'll ruin the moment. And, depending on the moment, they're probably right. If, if that's what's going on, I won't go up to somebody in advance. Um, mm -hmm. But I will often go up to people um, if I want to do a portrait, say, hey, you, you got a great look. I'd really love to take your picture. Or I'll take the picture and then chase them down and say, hey, man, you know, I just took your picture. Are you okay with this? Um, but 
even if you know, and, and I don't like I said, I'm, I'm not shy about walking up to strangers and and explaining what I'm doing. Um, I'm also, you know, if, if the moment comes and goes, and I don't get a chance to talk to them, uh, as long as it's legal, then rock and roll. Mm-hmm. So look, I opened this one, right? The next one, can you see it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is a street scene, you know, full of people. And uh, here's uh, something else I want to ask you because you know there is this ongoing, you know, um, discussion also, and, pe- and people are kind of in the unknown. So this is a street scene, uh, it also including children, right? Yeah. How is the situation right now in the U.S. actually when it comes to those laws, when it comes to photography? The, 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 the law, as I understand it, um, and, and which is very different than ethics. Um, but the law is as long as you and or the subject are in a public spot, the shot is legal. So if I'm standing in the middle of the street and somebody's got their curtains open, I can take a picture of them in their house. Well, Likewise, really? yep. Um, if their curtains are open, I mean, a lot of the paparazzi do that. You know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the photographer is in. Now, again, this is very different than ethics. Um, really? But. The mm. if if the if, if I'm in my house and you go walking by on the street, you're in a public spot, so you know, it's it's legal then uh, as well. Yeah, I, I I was I would imagine and also this is same here. I think I would imagine this fir- first kind of scenario when I am you know as a, as a subject when I am on the on the street in a public place. But I didn't know about this fact that when you are as a photographer in the public space and somebody has the curtains open, this is new to me, kind of. This is why you sometimes see, um, you know, the, the less respectable uh, photographers out there with really big lenses, um, because they're in a public spot um, yeah. and they're they're looking for that moment of privacy. And there are a lot of gray areas, in that, and in, you know, the there is what's called a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you are a celebrity, you've sort of given that up. If you're a politician, you've given that up. Um, so I, you know, I might, you know, if I were to take a picture of you in your house, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. I might actually, you know, be sued for that one. But if you were a famous actor, you know, who solicits attention, then, you know, that, that, I see. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the ethics are now a completely different thing. Um, there's a long, unsolvable, but ongoing and necessarily ongoing conversation about photographing children, about photograph photographing vulnerable populations. Um, you know, do you photograph the homeless? You know, who may or may not have the agency to say no. Um, you know, do you photograph children? And I don't know of a rule for that as much as what feels right at the moment and, and your own personal sense of ethics. In that picture that you just had up of, of the young boy jumping at, at the county fair, um, you can't tell who it is. It's face facing away from you. The so th- th- there's nothing in there, in in that shot, which is identifying or or um, the the kind of image where I think I, I'm taking advantage. Okay, th- then we then we have your your beautiful landscapes, right? <laughs> uh, so you're really enjoying like uh, it, it's so I understand photograph. So I can imagine the camera is. With you at all times, or ninety percent of the time, I, I am one of those people who always has the camera with me. It, it's in my shoulder bag. Every you know, if I walk out of my office, uh, I have the camera with me. And right. I'm going to say, you know, a lot of people will say, "Well, me too." I've got my cell phone. Uh, my I have a really bad cell phone, so I, I, I take a good camera with me when I go. Also, yesterday during the exhibition, I mentioned before during this open talk here. Uh, those guys also discussed, you know, the f- so we, we were visiting an exhibition, looking at the pictures of the wall, right, the prints, and, uh, you know, at some point the curator actually said, you know, uh, Guido, Guido, his name is Guido, the photographer, uh, you know, in the very end, I don't really care uh, what you use to produce your photo. So th- this guy, for example, he works with ca- uh, Camera Obscura. Among okay. Okay. He yep. built, I mean, he, he found a building. It's one on one of the Swiss, you know, mountain passes. He found an old building and the upper floor in this building was kind of abandoned. He asked the owner if he could build a camera obscura 
in this room. And he did. It's a dark room with a two uh, centimeter, very, very small hole on one of the walls. And it really creates the image on the, on the back wall, you know, of the crazy. He then hangs photographic paper, you know, makes huge print of what this, what this camera obscura produces. And some of those pictures were at the exhibition. And, you know, and he was, of course, very, very excited and very proud of the whole process. <laughs> then the curator came in and said, I know your process. I, 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 I appreciate and really, you know, the entire effort is amazing. And I know how you feel about it. But if you would have told me that this photograph was taken with a mobile phone and not with this building, Camera Obscura, I don't know if my reaction would be really different. First of all, if I would not know about it. So, mobile phone, camera obscura, a DSLR, you know, medium format camera, film camera, digital. Does it matter? I, I don't think it does, finally, to the viewer of the image. Now, once, once you get a little, just a little bit more sophisticated, then the tech does inform the story. And then it does inform your appreciation of the image, um, you know, to understand that some painter, you know, invented a new kind of brush stroke. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't change the picture of the boat on the lake, but it informs your understanding of the picture of the boat on the lake. Um, so, yeah, it, it does make it finally a, a richer experience to know how it came along. But I, I'm really firmly of the camp. Uh, that you, you find your own voice, both in, in terms of the images you produce, but in terms of the gear you use. Um, you know, there are sax players out there that, you know, play alto and not baritone um, because that's who they are. That's the sound that most uh, resonates with their heart and soul. Okay, what, what about the landscapes? What, what uh, drags you into those kind of scenes? Or are you looking for something you know, in particu particular when it comes to, to landscape photography, are they kind of, kind of minimalistic, many of yep. them? My, my landscape photography um, is, is the great beneficiary of good breaks in my car uh, because, the, the, again, serendipity, chance, you know, happens. That, that picture right there which is one of my favorites, and oddly enough, it's in color. Um, I was simply driving home from Denver back to Fargo, and I was taking some back roads, uh, in Wyoming to get there. And it was a morning, a big fog had just rolled through. It was a little bit cold, so there was hoarfrost. And I came upon this one tree sitting out there, um, hit the brakes, pulled over, made sure I wasn't going to get smacked by a truck going by, um, and took this picture. The amount of planning that went into this shot was all on site. Oh, there's a cool site. Let me, where do I want to stand? How do I want to frame it? You know, this kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I probably have 15 pictures from that mm. morning that, that I'm really proud of. But no. I'm, not, I'm not somebody who goes out intentionally to a site to take landscape photographs. There, there is a little bridge over the Buffalo River here in town that I discovered several years ago when I was trying to take pictures of um, harvest at night. You know, when the giant combines are all going, when their lights are shining and all the corn or beet dust is up in the air. And I discovered this setting quite by accident, but it's here in town. And that is one place I go back to a lot just to see what it looks like in different weather conditions. But other than you that, no. You will have it here in, the, in your portfolio somewhere? I don't know if I have that picture up there or not. But I mean, no, look at the Empire, look at that Empire State Building picture right there, though. I mean, that's just, I walked into a hotel room, I looked out my window, and that's what I saw. And I said, oh, man. You know, so the, the planning was zero. The framing was absolutely serendipitous. Yeah. Um, you know, to put the camera on the windowsill. Um, no, and away we go. Good picture, Robert. It's a... Uh, so, okay, so you kind of, you... Yeah, you, you obviously have a great eye. You react to, at least in my, you know, <laughs> opinion... <laughs> You, you react to, I mean, you, you notice things like this, like, you know, there's the mm -hmm. Empire State Building, you, you, you include the curtains and the, you know, parts of the window frame and, and it creates this special kind of, um, yeah, multi-layered kind of image. It's really, you know, dragging. It's, it's not just Empire State Building, something right. 
it's something more, it's a different perspective. So what what do you want? I mean, you 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 know present the pictures, the photographs in public. I mean, on on your website or you share them on social media. Final goal: Do you even think about it? What, what do you want the the viewer? Uh, how 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 do you want the viewer to react to do your to your photographs? Do you even think about it? Is there a, of of importance or not really? Or wh why do you then show them to the to the you know public? I, I I have a for for me a, a really clear intent, um, and that is simply to have the viewer look at the image and say that's cool, and and then start then start going in and, and digging why. Um, when, when I when I teach poetry writing to my creative writing students, you know, I tell them you know a poem has to reward a first reading as well as a hundred and first reading. Um, you, you, you don't start with great mysteries and enigmas and, and, and you, know, wi you know, wild associations. It's got to reward that first blush. Um, and I feel the same thing is true about my, my photographs. It needs to reward that initial viewing. Um, and then the more time you, you spend with it, if it's a good image, um, you start really seeing different elements in it. Um, and and it becomes more complicated the more you look at it. Yeah. About the black and white, you know, uh, versus color, because right, yeah. Back to the tree image uh, before we are looking at the you you decided to to you know have it in color. Uh, but you know some of the other images here are in black and white. But so but when I look at this image, when we you know we we looked at before at, of the lonely tree right in the field, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think about you know converting it to black and white, I think it would work in a different way, but equally equally fine. What made you decide to not go black and white with it? Well, if you see an image of mine in color, it, it's because the color defeated my my desire for black and white. Um, my gut reaction to everything I see is black and white. I have my camera set to both square format and black and white in the viewfinder. So when I press the shutter release, that's what I'm seeing. This image, standing in the field, I just knew in my heart would be a rock and roll black and white image. I got it to my screen and my computer, and I converted it, and my instant feeling was that I had just lost something. So then I went back to color, I went back to black and white, and I said, no, in, in this one, you know, the, the, the color absolutely defeated my my aesthetic um and so i said okay this one deserves to be in color um you know there there is another shot uh for example of an orange hallway that is a hallway a, a staircase hallway in my house and whatever i was doing i came around the corner and, and it's our, our bedroom's off to the right there whatever my wife was watching on tv was suddenly bright orange and i oh i see and I said, what in the world? I went and grabbed my camera real quick. I, I took, I didn't even pause for settings or anything. Those walls are all white. Those all, those walls are all absolutely just eggshell white. But whatever she was watching was orange. And I said, I got to grab this. Yeah. So, so this is, um, this is a perfect example, you know, of, okay. I was, when I, uh, you know, looked at this image, I was, I was not sure, but my very first instinctive reaction was, okay, amazing uh, beam of, of, of sunlight. Yeah, good bet. And, uh, this staircase, you know, through, through whatever window. I thought it was sunlight, Re really, you know, maybe, maybe very early, maybe very late in the day, but <laughs> you, you mentioned yep. the TV screen. Amazing. And, and, and again, you, know, you, you talk about, you know, you, you spend a little bit of time with it, You'll notice the left-hand window is dark. The right-hand window is bright. Mm -hmm. You've got the different tonalities on the different sides. You got that little creepy little shadow down in the bottom and in, in the center, yeah. um, which is you know balanced by the reflection on the ceiling up top. It is just one of those. It, it could have been an absolute failure, but when I looked at it, I thought, "Oh, this is fun." Yeah. So yeah, you're also a writer, right? And uh, right. And you mentioned also your photos, you know, you feel like the main idea about your photography is to tell stories. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously a different medium, yeah? It's a, you know, 
a book can have 2,000 pages and a photo, photograph. Sometimes it's a series, of course, of photographs, but you know, very often, and in your case, it's, I think, often uh, single images, right? You also work in some series, but it's often an, an image. Yeah, so it's you know, a wide frame. Said, I, I work in series a lot, but the individual image in the series has to work as a standalone image. Yeah, so how, how do you, you know, uh, how do you find this way? I mean, such, such a different process, right? Writing a book which has several, you know, I know, hundreds of pages or whatever it mm -hmm. might be, and then this single image. Is it like, do you really feel fulfilled when, you know, and, you know, when we're creating this one frame and... Oh, I, I, my, my, I, I am a firm believer that, that when my photography works, it, it is narrative photography. Uh, I mean, for example, click on the bottom right one there. There's something about that image. I mean, there's a basketball net and a hockey net on, <laughs> on the same court. And you think, okay, and, you know, th th there's no sense whatsoever. But you can't stop looking at it and figuring out what game might be played there, et, et cetera. Um, you know, th is it an earth-shaking photograph? No. But is it the kind where you have an immediate feeling of, huh? And then, then you start imagining stories. Then you start filling in blanks that, that aren't really there. And, you know, to me, storytelling is is really the thing that holds the dearest spot in my heart you know yeah. you know and I, I haven't given up writing i'm still writing travel stuff i'm still writing you know criticism and reviews and all that kind of stuff but the the ability to say i want to tell you a story uh and deal with implication deal with suspense deal with tension that that's the payoff for me yeah it's kind of close to the uh, you know, my idea when, you know, I, I love this photo, but now why exactly? Like you say, there is so many unknowns, you know, yeah. in the, and so it's kind of, I have this idea of, you know, asking questions with your photo. Mm -hmm. So basically you, you capture this scene and yeah, there's so many questions exactly. Why the basketball and this happy yeah. goal here? What, you know, what are the houses? Who is living in there? Why is nobody there? Right. Yep. Uh, so I love this kind of photography and I think you can you probably operate in the, in the similar way. Scott, you you basically you 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 notice things. <laughs> you really look. You really you know uh, notice details. Notice some kind of you know single elements, stories, light. Um, yeah, is it like can you uh, can you r occasionally relax and not do it, or is it something which you think is always going on? You know this observing machine. I I. I, I even if you involved in, are involved, you know, busy with other tasks. Let's say you're teaching. You, yeah. Do you also notice light? Oh yeah. I mean, classroom and and you and you just hate the you just hate that you can't grab the camera at this very moment and photograph. Or you do. I I I I, 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 I know I, I I know sometimes I do. I mean, my students are are quite accustomed um, to to me noticing stuff in the periphery. Um, you know, they, they know in advance, I'm always going to read whatever their shirts say. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, look for complications or ironies. Um, you know, people will sit next to each other with, with, um, different clothes or books or, or whatever. And I'll, I'll notice comparisons, but, and, and, you know, light and mood and, and, and all of that are really, really important to me. Um, and, and, you know, Part of that comes from from being a writer first, because you had to describe the, those same things. You have to find a language for the visual, you know, if you are uh, a writer. And and as a matter of fact, you know, I carried a camera with me for years as a writer just to take notes, you know, because it's much easier to snap a quick picture of a barn than to try and stand there and describe it uh, in the field. Mm. So noticing whatever. Um, has been with me since the very beginning. And frankly, it's a source of pleasure. So I, I have no interest in giving it up. So I want to ask you, and I had, had a, you know, consecutive guests as well. Okay, this, this last piece of wisdom, last piece of, last kick of inspiration, you know, to those of, you know, you watching, Scott, what would you have, you know, like, a, just like a, any random thought, you know, to, to, to give our viewers this kick for tomorrow, for today, you know, when it comes to yeah. the photography. What, what is it? Like, it, Maybe it, when it, you lack, when you start, 
or there are those moments, you know, inspiration, inspiration whatever, I, I don't feel it. What is this one thing that, that keeps you going then? You know, it, it, this is going to sound really cliche and, 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 and cheesy and stuff, but I was just thinking about this a second ago. Um, I know photographers that go out in the field with a sketchbook and they will sit down on a rock and they will draw the landscape they're looking at um, before they pick up their camera. Um, for them, it's a very mindful, very methodical, very slow process to really see light, to see how it's changing over a landscape, to see proportions between uh, subjects and stuff. Um, I know other photographers who are dedicated to the studio, to controlling every single bit um, of the image that's out there. And I'm completely not either of those things. Um, you know, I... I, I celebrate uh, serendipity and chance and, and happenstance. And so the only advice I've got is, is, the, is the old sort of cliche of to thine own self be true. You know, whatever works for you, let the, re let the rest of the noise from the photographic how-to community uh, be just that. I mean, learn from it whatever you can. I mean, I admire studio photographers. I admire the, the careful, mindful landscape people. Um, but there is nothing of that in the voice that I am developing. Um, and so it is knowledge that informs my practice, but not is my practice. And again, just w whatever is, is the best way for you to say what you got to say, do it. Yeah. Uh, with a very big dose of confidence, I could say drawing, it would not be the thing for me. I can't draw. So yeah, neither can I. <laughs> any photographer you know you recently noticed or caught your you know whose work caught your eye you would recommend uh, to reach out to to have here to, to to talk to on this channel i i i am blessed by having so much photography cross my desk in, in a day um either with the book reviews or social media or, or whatever i i know there there is no one photographer right now uh, that I give me say. one name. I, I will call him or her to tonight. Uh, there must be someone who you, who you really, whose work you really enjoyed. Maybe yesterday, maybe last week. There's a guy named Bruce Haley. I just reviewed his new book. It's called Winter, uh, landscape photographs um, of a completely unromantic, not stylized, not made pretty, unromantic way. That's, that struck me as here's somebody who got to the emotional truth of a season. And then the book is, is an arc from the beginning of winter through middle of winter to spring. Um, th there, there is a real difficulty to make the made object not look like a made object. And he hit it hit dead on. Okay. I'll make sure I, I reach out to Bruce. Let's, let's have him here. You know, talk. Okay. Okay, Scott, thank you so much. So, uh, great conversation, and uh, I, I will definitely see you around. Yeah? Okay, I hope so. See you later, Tomas. Okay, see you. Bye-bye.